We give our test results of the 2020 Ram 1500 diesel, discuss the recently announced Honda Civic and Subaru BRZ, and can your key fob actually drain your car's battery? Find out next on Talking Cars. Hi everyone and welcome back to another episode. I'm John Linko. I'm Mike Quincy. And I'm Mike Monticello. And as we know with COVID, everything's topsy-turvy, tossed around, we're, we're quarantining, we're hiding out, we're staying home, we're not interacting. Same thing with auto shows. There are no auto shows. So what's going on, you ask, with, new, with debuts? Well, they're all virtual. So this week, we're going to talk about three recent announcements for new cars, all virtual, of course, but we covered them at ConsumerReports.org, and the three of us are going to each pick one car, talk about it, and, and give some highlights. First up, Monty, the new Honda Civic. What's going on with that? It's it's the the popular small car. It's been around for decades now. What's Honda doing differently? Yeah, so this 2022 uh, Honda Civic that they just recently unveiled, it's going to be the 11th generation of the Civic. Can you guys believe that? 11 generations. Um, and Honda says uh, it's going to have more advanced technology and safety features than before, uh, a new chassis. Um, officially what they're, they've shown is a prototype, but as we've seen with, uh, other Acura and Honda debuts, what they usually call a, a prototype ends up being very close styling wise to, to what the production car will be. And we assume that And it, it, if you look at it, it kind of looks like a smaller, uh, TLX, the Acura TLX that they, that they just came out with not too long ago. Yeah. I think um, Honda actually, they just add windshield wipers and then they put it on the sales floor. Like yeah, literally that's, that's what they end up doing. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, it's kind of nice though, because sometimes you, with prototypes, you think, you know, they end up not looking very similar to, but at least with Honda and Acura, we know, okay, that's pretty close to what the car is going to look like. Um, it's going to come in sedan and hatchback form. There'll be a sportier SI and high performance type R versions coming a little bit later. Um, and they haven't confirmed the uh, engines yet, but we're assuming it's going to be, they're going to be small displacement uh, turbocharged engines is what will be available. It's going to come standard with uh, forward collision warning, automatic emergency braking, lane departure warning, lane keeping assistance, and adaptive cruise control. What we don't know yet is if they're still going to continue to use their lane watch system instead of blind, you know, a true uh, side mirror based uh, blind spot warning system. We're hoping they're going to switch to that, but they haven't told us that yet. One interesting note, there's a kind of an illustration of the interior and that shows a traditional Prindle, as we call it, uh, gear selector, which we're hoping because we're, we're not big fans of the Honda and Acura push button system, which we're seeing on more Hondas lately. So hopefully they are going back to this uh, traditional uh, gear selector for this car. Um, Maybe Beyond that means that, they'll have a stick too, you know, so they'll just have the same space and it'll just be one or the other. Right. Well, I, I mean, there's definitely going to be a manual transmission for the Type R, uh, hopefully for the SI as well. Uh, it goes on sale in late spring uh, next year, uh, 2021. Mike Quincy, what do you think about the, the new Civic and, you know, any thoughts on it? Just, you know, I mean, I think all of us actually remember every generation of the Civic, which is actually kind of sad when you think about it. Um, you know, <laughs> it, just, it just shows that we're old. I don't know. Uh, you said um, it, and, me. and that's sad. I, I implied you said. Um, but anyway, I mean, what do you think? You know, the, the looks, the, the, the slimmed down interior, any thoughts on it? I'm I'm a long term fan of Honda Civics. My first new car was an '87 SI. Uh, still loved that car. One of the most fun cars I've ever driven. Even though it wasn't you know big on horsepower, it couldn't hold a candle to the to the GTI, which was the hot hatchback of the time. Um, and, but I'm I'm glad that Honda hasn't lost its its sense of fun. Uh, I'm glad that they're you know more or less committing to sporty versions because that's really where it's at. And and really what one of the one of the the sleeper models of the Civic lineup that's that's available right now are the 2020 Honda Civic Sport. It's not as fast or racy as the SI or the Type R, but it's still available with a manual. It's light. It's fun to drive. It's one of those cars that really flies under the radar. And I'd say uh, if, you, if you can't wait for the redesigned Civic, go out and look for a Civic Sport with the manual. You will not be disappointed. Well, you know, it, it's, it, you know, talking about under the radar, you know, the car that you're, you're going to talk about next Subaru BRZ just got released, you know, and, and that's one of those like, wait, Subaru doesn't make all all wheel drive vehicles, you know, let alone 
<laughs> manual transmission as well. So what? tell us about the new one. Well, it's, it's interesting because you, know, you we all work in automotive publishing and it would, so, it would be so easy to say, oh, every Subaru comes standard with all-wheel drive, except one, the BRZ. So Subaru is calling this a 2022 model and it comes with a new 2.4 liter four-cylinder engine. It's not the turbo. It's not the WRX engine. So, you know, don't get all upset about it. it, it Subaru says it's going to put about uh, out about uh, 228 horsepower and that's a 23 horsepower boost compared to the last model. You can still get a six-speed manual as well as a six-speed automatic. Uh, the suspension, the chassis has been updated. Uh, Subaru says it weighs under 2,900 pounds. And uh, yeah, listen, we, we've been huge fans of these cars for a long time. Uh, one of the, uh, we, it, for our tire test program, uh, we used a, a similar Toyota 86 to test our uh, ultra high performance tires at our track. Um, and just a, a quick, quick story about, uh, about the BRZ for me. I remember a track day several years ago, uh, back when the Mustang was still offered with the Boss 302 trim. I took a, lot, a lap in the Boss and I thought, God, this is the best track car I've ever driven. And then I did a lap in the BRZ and just like that, the BRZ was the best track car I've ever driven. Uh, I mean, it's it's so tossable. It's balanced. It has this excellent 50-50 uh, front to rear weight ratio. Uh, it, it, the, the front tires tell you exactly what's going on. With just enough horsepower, you can sort of steer with the throttle. Uh, it is so much fun and such a great as you said, under under the radar car. I mean, listen, it's kind of noisy. It's kind of small. It's rear wheel drive. So here in the Northeast, it makes no sense for a day to day driver. But but boy, what a great car! And I'm so glad that Subaru is still committed to making it. Yeah, I mean, you know, it it, it looks a little little more modern, mature inside. But uh, I, I believe for you know from what Subaru's talked about, it, it hasn't lost the you know the essence of it. Uh, the the last vehicle we're we're talking about the opposite of both of those. Um, it's it's a big family family haul, or the Acura MDX. The 2022 Acura MDX uh, was was recently announced. Now, just like Mike talked about, there was first the MDX prototype, which uh, shockingly looked identical to some of the images in the <laughs> 2022 MDX that's being sold. Um, you know, which which kind of makes it easy for planning out images on the website. Uh, this is going to cat use a 3.5 liter V6, 290 horsepower, just like the current generation. That that's you know, or the now departing generation. Um, big thing is that Acura seems to be, you know, they, they've kind of been a, a tweener, not luxury, not sport. You know, they're, they, uh, historically they came out, you know, with, it was Lexus first from Toyota and, and Infinity from Nissan and Ac and Honda had Acura, the luxury divisions. And, you know, for a while the MDX was really sporty offering and it just kind of lost its way perhaps. So this one, uh, they've talked about, it's going to have a double wishbone front suspension, uh, you know, Keep the tires planted better, uh, improving ride quality and handling at the same time, not one versus the other, uh, much like the Acura TLX, which is uh, uh, which is now on sale. Um, that's using a double front double wishbone as well. Um, the, uh, the the big thing that they are going to have is a Type S version. So that's their Audi S BMW M version. So uh, the, the Type S is going to have a, a three liter turbocharged V6. Uh, so a different engine, about 355 horsepower, only all wheel drive, more aggressive suspension settings, bigger wheels and tires. Um, but also the luxury quotient seems to have been, been really upped uh, by Acura. You know, it's roomier inside. It's grown a little bit, a little wider, a little longer. Uh, there's more room behind the third row seat when it's raised, more room when the second and third row seats are lowered. So, uh, you know, it, it's family friendly and useful, uh, but also supposedly more, you know, coddling and also a little more fun to drive. Hopefully a whole, you know, fresh take will, will do a lot for this model. Uh, look for it in dealers, uh, early 2021 base prices range from 46,900 all the way up to $60,650. So on that note, we're going to move over to uh, our test results on the Ram 1500 diesel pickup truck that uh, we just completed testing on. Uh, we bought a 2020 Ram 1500 Bighorn Crew Cab 4x4. Yeah, try saying that fast. <laughs> yeah. It has a 260 horsepower, 3 liter V6 turbo diesel engine, 8 speed automatic transmission. And it starts at $42,640 for the Ram. Cloth bucket seats, $495. We got the Bighorn Level gr 2 Group. It sounds like a band. $2,500 with a couple things with auxiliary power outlets, in-floor storage for the second row seats, Android Auto and Apple CarPlay compatibility, the big 8.4-inch Uconnect touchscreen, um, but not the biggest 
touchscreen, by the way. Um, heated front seats and steering wheel. We also got a 3.92 rear axle ratio for $95. The diesel engine is a $4,995 option on it. Um, you basically buy the Ram and add the diesel engine. Um, we got 20 inch wheels, $1,595. Trailer brake control, $295. Adding in destination charge of $1,695. Monty, I want to hear you comment on that. The total price, <laughs> $54,310. So we have, we've got truck lot guy one and truck guy two here. Uh, I'm going to throw this to Quincy first. You know, tell us, tell us about the ride and handling. You know, just give us, give us something about the Ram. Well, listen, the, 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 the Ram is continues to be like the benchmark for ride in terms of pickup trucks. Uh, we're real big fans of the coil springs used in the rear suspensions. These are not leaf springs. Uh, the limited version of the Ram also offers an air suspension that, that elevates the ride comfort, really almost a luxury car standard. So if you haven't driven a pickup truck in a long time, get in the Ram, you'll be amazed on how good the ride is. Now, it, it, listen, this is a big truck. So in terms of handling, it's, it's not gonna be a sports car. It's not gonna be a BRZ. But it's a lot more agile than you'd think. Um, it, it, it has responsive steering. It's engaged much more so than competing models. You put that all together combined with a pretty quiet cabin. And it is it is quite a, a decent cruiser when you're outside of like using it for, for work stuff. But so performance wise, the Ram has completely impressed all of us here at Consumer Reports. Yeah. Well, you know, Mike, you know, what, what's the, uh, you, you're going to tell us a little bit about the interior and, and the, you know, the experience of living with it, but also, you know, that, that touch screen I mentioned sounds big, but there's an even bigger one, right? That we don't yeah. have. Yeah. There's an even bigger one, an absolutely gigantic one, but, uh, which, uh, you know, I, I, this one's actually big enough for me. I think the controls, that's one of the things about the Ram is that the controls, uh, work really well. The infotainment screen works well. The rest of the, you know, secondary controls are all easy to use. The interior's, uh, also really nice. It's, it's basically the nicest in terms of the materials that they use for the, the plastic panels. And, and like I said, those controls, just the way the controls feel is, is the best in the full size pickup segment. Um, so that part's really good. But I mean, the big thing here is the diesel engine. I mean, that's, that's, we'd already tested a Ram 1500 with the V8. Now we we're, we've tested the turbo diesel, this new Ram with this, uh, diesel engine, it's, you know, like you said, John, it's it's almost a four a five thousand dollar option. So you have to realize that going in. It's a pretty expensive engine package, but it it does and it completely changes the truck. It's it's not as quiet as the V8. It has, you know, does have that diesel, you know, gravel sound, especially at idle when it's cold and a little bit when you take off when it's cold. And acceleration is gonna be louder too. But it's got a diesel character that if you like diesels, which I do and I believe Quincy does as well, you'll love it because it's got immediate power off the line. The transmission still shifts uh, quite smoothly um, and it doesn't, you know, it's going to run out of power up high. It's nowhere near as quick in zero to 60 acceleration as the V8 Ram because it runs out of steam at like, you know, before 4,000 RPM, it's done. It builds all its power down low. But what it does have is considerably better fuel economy than the V8 version that we tested. Right. And uh, because of that, the low end torque that diesels are known for, it's it's great for uh, for towing and, you know, uh, hauling trailers and stuff like that. I love the way it drives. I love the diesel's relaxed nature. And keep in mind, these diesels are so much quieter than diesels from, you know, you know, 10 years ago. Right. It's, it's night and day. Honestly, it's almost, I wouldn't, mind if it was even a little more diesel because I enjoy I, I enjoy that diesel sound. You know, it just there's something about driving a truck with a, you know, a nice, nice sounding diesel. And, you and put on one, your big cowboy hat and, you know, <laughs> well, there's driver. plenty of room in that cabin, right? <laughs> I've got plenty of headroom. I'll wear my 10 gallon. I'm good to go. Well, you know, aside from a few little elements, you don't really have a super diesel experience. So it's it's a very good in between, a tweener type of. Uh, Absolutely. You know, but what, 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 what both you guys are glossing over is is the cruising range of the diesel. I mean, you, you fi fill it with diesel fuel, get on the highway. And Monty, I was kind of cringing a little bit when you're like, oh, you know, you talk about the noise. Once you're up to, to cruising speeds on the highway and you have like adaptive cruise control set and a full tank of fuel, you, you just go forever, it seems like. I mean, the, the cruising range is really what, what sells me on, on the diesel. I, I do miss the, the, the excellent exhaust note that Chrysler has done with the 5.7 liter gas V8. But and so if you if you if you put the the, the five point seven and the diesel Ram in front of me, I, I honestly would have a tough time choosing because I like them both. But right now I'm kind of leaning a little bit toward the diesel. But cruising range quick, does it for me. 
Quince, give us a little bit just before we, we finish up uh, with, with the safety features that are in this, because, you know, we're, we're seeing more uh, advanced driver, you know, uh, you know, an assistant, you know, safety and assistance systems uh, making their way into trucks. But still, it, it, they're not not like cars, even not like, you know, gosh, a lot of compact cars. Or they're just standard across the board, you know, and you're paying a huge premium, 54000 Right. Well, the the Ram is does not have standard lots of standard safety features, but it has available for, you know probably practically the whole roster. I mean, forward collision warning, automatic emergency braking, lane departure warning, rear cross traffic warning, blind spot warning, all available. And updates for 2021 include available pedestrian detection feature. Now you have to you know kind of pick and choose your options to make sure you get them. But the fact is that they are out there. They are available. Yep. All right. Well. Go to consumerreports.org, check it out. We've got reviews on uh, on both the the Ram and the Silverado diesel. Um, I, I I do agree that that ride of that Ram is is pretty impressive. So we're gonna move on to our, our our final section, which is questions. But before we move on, we just want to take a moment to let you know about the Talking Cars donation program. So if you're not aware, Consumer Reports is a nonprofit. So all of the work that we do is funded by memberships as well as donations. If you're able to give, it really does help us keep doing the work that we do, including this show. So you can find out more at cr.org slash givetalkingcars. Thank you very much. And now we're going to move on to audience questions. Our first question comes from Bob, who says, while my wife will go shopping for 30 minutes or so, I'll sit in the car and read a book. Twice when trying to start the car afterwards, my battery was dead. My tow truck driver said the fob in my pocket continuously communicated with the car, draining the battery. I confirmed this with my dealer to my surprise. Is this situation common with push to start models? That's a, that's a key part. Mike, uh, you've done some a bunch of fob stories, uh, some some popular ones on consumerreports.org. So why don't you tell us what you what you think about this? Yeah, well, first of all, it's a bummer. Obviously, anytime you go to restart your car, especially when you're out, you know, it's one thing at home, but one th- another thing when you're out in public and and uh, you can't get back home. But uh, the the tow truck driver and the dealer is is correct in the sense that that key. Uh, will constantly try to communicate with the car. So, and that does cause a drain on the battery. I talked with CR's chief mechanic, John Ibbotson, to say, okay, but why is it going completely dead? That seemed kind of weird. And he said his his guess is that it's more about an aging uh, battery than it is, you know, something wrong with the, the key fob. But keep in mind, we have test cars that we keep in our shop all the time, and they'll be in there for days or weeks at a time, and we, uh, almost never have a battery uh, draining issue. When we do, John says it's usually because someone left uh, an accessory on or the key on. I think in other words, he's blaming us is what he's saying. <laughs> right, right. But um, it's the car's battery that's an issue. The, the key fob uh, the key fob is in a sense causing the issue, but it's but really it's the car's battery that that is most likely old or aging. The, the reality is what probably uh, uh, Bob needs to do is to get a new battery. And wouldn't Bob, you're so lucky because we actually rate batteries on the consumerreports.org website. We have a whole bunch of batteries uh, in there. Um, so go check that out. You'll likely need a new battery. Uh, the other thing is obviously just make sure that when you are sitting there, make sure that the car is completely off because if something's on that, then you, then you could be draining the battery. But if the car is completely off, it should not be going dead in 30 minutes of sitting there. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. Um, Our next question comes from Wallace from New York, who says, with the world being a global enterprise and auto auto manufacturers building cars in various countries, could you please provide insight on where cars are being built? Domestic car makers are outsourcing, yet imports are being built in the US. Even some GM vehicles are being built in China. Do cars have a country of origin anymore? Mike Quincy, this has been a uh, a ballywick for you, I guess we would say, uh, uh, you know, because you've talked about this a lot on, on media and, and, you know, different interviews and, and in our stories. So it, it's, it's a hot topic because there are some people that, you know, they say, oh, I want to buy American. And, and it's, and it's increasingly, even over the last 20 years, increasingly difficult to define exactly what an American car was. But I, I love this question because, you know, cars are built everywhere and, and they're getting components sourced from everywhere, literally. And and John, you had a great idea to look up some window stickers of some of our recent test cars. And so I picked a few, and um, I think you might find this stuff interesting. So our Land Rover Defender, so Land Rover is a British manufacturer, but also a subsidiary of India's Tata Motors. So we've got British, we got India. The engine is from the UK. 
The transmission is from Germany, and it's assembled in Nitra, Slovakia. So it's all over the place. Uh, our Kia K5, a Korean manufacturer, the window sticker says, 55% of the content came from US slash Canada, 35% of the content came from Korea, and it's assembled in West Point, Georgia. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to, to, to put, a, put a bow on this, we talked about the Ram 1500, and this is a great one. I love this. So, so Ram is a US manufacturer, but also part of Fiat Chrysler. And look at that. Monty's doing a visual here. Um, that's, the, that's the Rams window sticker. I was going to say it if you didn't. I didn't realize you were going to talk about it. But yeah, tell them where the engine and everything is. So, so yeah, so it's a U.S. manufacturer, but also owned by Fiat Chrysler. Um, 53% of the contact came from U.S. slash Canada. 26% of the contact came from Mexico. The engine is from Italy. The transmission is from Germany. And it's assembled in Sterling Heights, Michigan. So we're talking about a world car. I mean, it's coming from all over the place. And I think from a historical perspective, in 1978, Volkswagen built a factory in Westmoreland, Pennsylvania, and produced the first U.S.-built Volkswagen Rabbit. And it also produced the first U.S. spec Volkswagen Rabbit GTI, which we have a photo of. So, you know, that could be one of the starting points about, you know, defining what an American car is. And really, they're probably, you'll never find a new vehicle that's 100% made in any one country anymore. I mean, there's there's been a huge commitment from auto manufacturers from around the globe in terms of U.S. investment. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to name them all, but but BMW has assembly plant in South Carolina. Honda's in Ohio. Nissan is in Tennessee. Subaru's in Indiana. And then on the other hand, as the question stated, you know, GM, FCA, and Ford all have factories in Mexico and Canada. So, I mean, you know, so, so what is an American car? What does this mean to you as the consumer? It really doesn't matter. I, I mean, Consumer Reports has always been about get the best car for your money, get the most safety for your money. Uh, there's such a variety of cars these days, and but they are literally coming from all points of the globe, components coming from everywhere. And, you know, that is, yeah. that's, just, that's just global manufacturing in the year 2020 and going forward. Yeah, you know, you'll you'll see a, like a, a lot of enthusiasts, and, and they don't have to be like super sports enthusiasts, but they're just an, you know have an affinity for a brand. They'll talk about, oh, you know, well, this version of it was built in Graz, Austria, and this version of the car was built in South Africa, and you want the South African VIN, you don't want the blah VIN, and, and and you know, from what we've seen, it's really just, it's it's a lot more about manufacturing process and about the manufacturer than the country of origin. The key thing, uh, you know, that a lot of people, they argue about is where the final dollar goes. Does it go back to Ford in Dearborn, based in Dearborn, Michigan, or does it go back to Fiat Chrysler, based in Italy? You know, you could also make the same argument in the fact that, well, are you paying the salary of an uh, of an American who's assembling a vehicle for Honda, you know, in Marysville, Ohio, um, you know, and, and all the suppliers there. So, look, if it doesn't matter that we what we have seen as far as reliability um, spend your dollar as as wisely as you feel is important. And if it's going back to the manufacturer, then you're buying from a domestic. Just understand that that domestic car may be built in Mexico and that, uh, you know, foreign foreign car, you know, from, from Europe or an Asian manufacturer may actually just be built in the United States by American workers. And that's where we go. Yeah. I mean, wow. the Ram, the Ram 1500 diesel says it all. I mean, it's an American truck yep. with an Italian turbo diesel engine. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> So that's going to bring us to our final question, which is from Philippe, who says, I am so glad you purchased a Land Rover Defender for testing. Should I trade mine in? I am not a hardcore off-roader, but approach, breakover, departure angle, and ground clearance are important to me. My wife and I are in our mid-50s and are looking for an SUV that is less rough than my current Defender, with comfort also being important. A new Defender is too expensive for us. We have no grandchildren yet, and we own a Volkswagen Jetta 2.5 liter for trips and a Suzuki Swift 1.2 liter for city driving. So now, uh, Monty, you need to, you're going to take this first. I want you to just give a little explanation for the for the audience. Uh, approach, breakover, departure angle, ground clearance, and then, uh, you know, talk about Philippe's vehicle because it's, it's not just a new Land Rover Defender <laughs> or his Land Rover. <laughs> so obviously, Philippe knows a little something about off-roading and approach and departure angle. It's all about when you're, like, say, going down into, you know, down a steep hill, 
what kind of ground clearance are you going to have on the front as you get to the bottom? And then what kind of ground clearance are you going to have on the back as you come down? You know, how is it, how much is it going to scrape on the back? This, this is serious off-roading. Uh, most people will think about ground clearance, you know, I mean, just as an example, like a Subaru Outback has 8.7 inches of ground clearance, which for a wagon-ish thing, which is what it is, or, or SUV, that it actually has more ground clearance than most SUVs or a lot of SUVs. Um, but I'm going to just call a little foul here on Philippe. <laughs> I don't think Philippe's uh, trading in that Defender. Have you seen? That thing is immaculate. Uh, yeah. I, I just can't see him parting with that. I know yeah, I Philippe would Philippe shared to. a picture of, of his yeah. Defender. So, uh, yeah, I don't even know if, if uh, let alone sell it, if it actually is just is going off road. It's so nice. <laughs> it's it's beautiful. And and hopefully he will be able to hold on to that. But, I you know, I'm sure, but as far as what to buy, because, yeah, I could see wanting a more modern, more comfortable um, SUV. You know what I'm thinking? Although we haven't driven it yet, the Ford, the new Ford Bronco Sport kind of seems like something it, that could possibly interest him. It's got, so the, the Bronco Sport is based on the Ford Escape, which is a, you know, nice driving little SUV, but it's more off-road. It's more off-roady. It's got more ground clearance. It has very, uh, short uh, front and rear ends, uh, for clearance. Um, and you know, it's, it's way less expensive than a Defender. Our Defender test vehicle is $70,000. You know, when you're looking at a, a Bronco Sport, you're going to be in the mid-$20,000 to $30,000 range. Um, and also, it its styling looks kind of like a Land Rover Freelander, if, if people remember that from like 15 years ago. It, it kind of looks like that. So although we haven't driven it, I would say maybe wait for that, wait and see what we think about it. And that might be uh, one option to go with. Quince, what do you, uh, what's on your plate for uh, Philippe? Well, Philippe, uh, keep this. Keep it, keep it, keep it. Uh, listen, it, it, your, your truck is, is you're really low tech, but it's a showstopper. But in trying to, you know, give you an answer to your question, I would go for a four to five year old, um, uh, Toyota 4Runner. So you've got some off-road capability. It's a utility vehicle. It's kind of like a wagon. You fold down the seats. You can haul stuff. When you get your grandchildren one of these days, you'll have plenty of room for their seats. Uh, it's capable off-road. Uh, it's there if, if you if you want it. And it's a lot less money than a new Defender. So th- that's that's my advice. But, but no, uh, the bottom line, uh, hold on to this beautiful, beautiful SUV. Uh I, Philippe, I think that these guys are full of it. You should, I'll, I got, uh, sounds about right. I got sounds five, right. I got five grand and, uh, tour the t- test track, uh, and I'll take that Land Rover off your hands. Um, they're not reliable, especially those old ones, too. So <laughs> yeah. would, oh, you should get rid of it. Yeah. You're going to do him a favor. You're going to do him a favor by taking it off. I do you a favor. Hands, come, right? come, yeah. come yeah. to Fast Johnny's car deal, <laughs> car lot. Okay. Um, okay. So, so look, yeah. The Bronco, I think, is a great idea, but it's going to take him a while to get it. Um, I, I couldn't go the Forerunner because I knew one of you, the other per, one of you, was going to say the Forerunner um, as a good <laughs> option because because it is because it's a good option. Um, yeah. So I'm going to go to a, a whole different way of thinking with this, uh, and I'm going to recommend that he look for a used Jeep Cherokee or maybe uh, a, you know a, a Jeep a Compass, you know, with the Trailhawk package. You know, they depreciate pretty heavily. I wouldn't get a new one. Um, I would get a couple years old model that has, you know, that off-road ability. It depends on, you know, really, he's got two different cars already. He's got a Volkswagen Jetta. He's got the Suzuki Swift that, that he already uses. Now, if the case was getting rid of those, uh, you know, for a vehicle, I might go a different way. But if it's going to be kind of a minimal use, I would get one of these, you know, trail rated Jeeps. They're very nice, but they also, you know, in, in the sense of like they have the modern comforts. Um, you know, you can get uh, advanced safety features. You can find some of those. It's got the Uconnect system. So you have comforts like that. But, you know, they're going to give you uh, some some decent off-road capability. John, I, th- I think you exploded Quincy's head. Quincy's no, I, head I was going to say, I, I saw it. Like, Monty, just... we've got to cut him off about the compass? Are you kidding me? Oh, my God. It was like one of the worst ones ever. <laughs> it's it's not a great vehicle. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not. And, you know, like. But if he it's, wants to I, bash I totally, around in the in the woods or something, it wouldn't be terrible. I, I and mean, that's why I'm saying they're among the lowest scoring tests. But if it's a banging around car, then that's what it is. It's the same in my argument as a Wrangler saying, well, you know, the Wrangler is not going to be a great commuter. And it's true. It's not. But you know what? It's fine for off road. I, I, I make no bones about it that I know it's not a CR. It's not a CR recommended <laughs> vehicle. But if it's simply something that you want to get. Uh, you know, with, with off-road ability and, and you could probably find a lot of them out there and you could probably get a good price. 
yeah, you know, why not? Yeah. I, on that note of me recommending someone get a, a cheap <laughs> compass or Cherokee, we're going to wrap up this episode. Um, as always, send us your questions, video questions, text questions, talking cars at iCloud.com. Uh, read the show notes below. Uh, it's for more information on what we've discussed. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.